Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to X-Fest. Yes, as I work my way through every single one of the X-Men movies and uh, review them. Alrighty, so today we're checking out X2, X-Men United, which is, in my opinion, one of the all-time greatest X-Men movies ever. I hadn't rewatched this for quite some time, and uh, just watching it again now... Man, I forgot just how freaking good this one is. Like, it really is good. And that's what we're going to talk about today on the Multimedia Chronicles. Welcome back. Alrighty, where to begin... Well, this takes place, uh, I guess, a few years after the first one, and uh, Magneto's still in his plastic prison, and uh, everything's all hunky-dory, until there's a mutant attack on the President of the United States. Oh my god! And we get to see Nightcrawler in action for the very first time. Holy moly. Was it ever a, a brilliant bit of casting getting uh, Scottish actor Alan Cumming as... Nightcrawler, just amazing. Like he was just so perfect as that character, and the makeup they they developed for him was just amazing. Just a fantastic job. Um, they really nailed that character perfectly. I have to say right off the bat, it's unfortunate that they did not continue to include Nightcrawler because he was always one of my favorite X Men when I was reading the comics in the 80s. He was always such a fun character. Now, that said, the the portrayal of him in this version is, is kind of an amalgamation of a couple different eras of the character. He found religion at one point in the comics and became very devout and so forth. Uh, that was after the era that I read, so I wasn't as familiar with that sort of side of the character. To me, he was always, he, he was the so-called fuzzy elf. <laughs> you know, he was the, the fun-loving acrobat uh, teleporting X-Men. Tended to be very lighthearted. I remember there was a four-issue miniseries focusing on him that was a lot of fun. He fought pirates and stuff in it. <laughs> and, yeah, so seeing uh, the version of the of the character in this was a little bit different because, uh, I mean, this was the introduction of the character and he was still very kind of guarded and, and, and keeping back. And you'd start to see inklings of the, the fun-loving Nightcrawler when he'd start to talk about his circus days, but they'd quickly, you know, climb him up because serious things were happening and they needed him to be serious, so he'd just kind of back off. And the poor guy just seemed really scared and out of sorts a lot of the time. But at the same time, very sympathetic, and, and he just couldn't help but love him. So it's, it's really a shame that they didn't carry on with him. I understand he is in the the new movie, Apocalypse, so I'm definitely looking forward to seeing the long-awaited return of Nightcrawler, a uh, younger version of the character, of course. The, the new one takes place in the 80s, so. so apparently there was a couple of reasons that they didn't keep Nightcrawler around, uh, one of which was Alan Cumming uh, just couldn't stand the makeup, <laughs> apparently. It took about 10 hours to put the makeup on for the uh, scene in the church where you see him more or less full body. You know, I guess less time when you don't see, you know, when it's just the face and, and hands and whatnot, but still quite a process to endure, needless to say. I mean, 10 hours, that's, that's more than a full work day for most mere mortals. So good on Alan Cumming for putting up with that. The other reason was just because uh, the producers felt that the character just wasn't getting enough to do and wasn't able to sort of contribute more to the team. But, I mean, I, I think that's kind of giving him the shaft for no reason because it was his introduction story. And as far as introducing the character and seeing what he can do, I thought it was fine. I mean, he had some great nightcrawlerish moments. I mean, there's the opening scene, of course, where he's bamfing around the the Oval Office, uh, taking out the President's uh, guards and everything, and then almost killing him. You know, I mean, that was very exciting and thrilling. And then there's the scene where Rogue gets uh, thrown out of the Blackbird, and he quickly teleports down and grabs her and then teleports back up to the plane to rescue her. I mean, that, that was great. That was a wonderful Nightcrawler moment. That actually reminded me of a moment in uh, the um, animated pilot. Pride of the X-Men. He, he did a very similar thing there. I think in that case it was a space shuttle. A very similar moment, so it was a nice little nod to those types of, of nightcrawlery moments. So uh, I liked that a lot. I should mention also the main plot, the whole story of William Stryker, 
and uh, his his plan to use his duplicate Cerebro and kidnap Professor X and have him use his psychic powers to kill all the mutants in the world, that is actually lifted straight out of the comics, like almost verbatim. Uh, specifically, this graphic novel right here, God Loves, Man Kills. This is where the character of William Stryker actually comes from. Now, in this graphic novel, he's basically a televangelist with a military background. If you can believe it, he's actually even more of a dick in the comic than he is in the movie. Yeah, in the comic, there's a flashback scene where he's talking about where his sort of hatred for mutants came from. It was when he was in the military, his wife was pregnant, they got into a car crash, she ended up giving birth to the baby, uh, the baby was clearly a mutant, like m much like Nightcrawler is very physically uh, apparent that it was a mutant. And uh, Stryker killed the baby right then and there, saw it as an abomination, a an affront to God, and killed his own newborn baby right there. And then, kind of blaming his wife for the whole thing, he snapped her neck. Yep and then put the bodies of the baby and his uh, wife into the wreck of the car and blew it up. What a sweetheart, eh? Yeah. So then he uh, carried on his religious crusade, essentially using the power of being a televangelist to spread the good word against mutants, and then orchestrated the plot to kidnap Professor X, plug him into the duplicate Cerebro, and use him to kill all the mutants. Yeah, so basically that that's the plot of X2 <laughs> right there. It's lifted almost straight out of the graphic novel. So if you ever re read this graphic novel, by the way, it's a classic Chris Claremont tale. Very, very serious, edgy, emotionally affecting X-Men story. It's one of the all-time greats. It's very emotionally powerful and it can be hard to take in parts, but as all good dramatic stories should be, but this really gets to the heart of the prejudice side of the X-Men uh, comics. So yeah, definitely check it out if you can. I'm pretty sure it's been reprinted a bajillion times. Uh, this is actually the fifth printing. Yes, I, I don't know. Actually, when, I, when did I get it? I don't know, sometime in the mid-80s. Anyway. So the character of William Stryker in the movie is not a straight uh, lift from the graphic novel. He's actually kind of an amalgamation of characters. So obviously borrows the name, obviously borrows the ideals. He's not a televangelist, though. He's a straight-up military guy. He's kind of combined with one of the doctors who headed up the Weapon X project and, I, I don't know, one or two other characters that I can't remember. Yeah, so elements of that all combined to make this combined embodiment of all of these various villainous traits of these different characters so and it works quite well played by the always wonderful uh brian cox so very very cool so in addition to the bigger story we also have the smaller story of wolverine trying to uh figure out his past and discover his origins and where he came from and regain his memories uh, he learns very quickly that striker is a link to that and through some flashback scenes, we learn that Stryker was present at the Weapon X project and uh, was part of how Wolverine became what he is. Uh, in fact, he actually finds the original lab where he was created, and it's still got molten adamantium bubbling away in there. And uh, Stryker explains that, you know, the tricky thing about adamantium is you have to keep it hot, because as soon as it cools, it becomes indestructible. So... <laughs> it's kept in a constant molten state for uh, similar projects, uh, such as Lady Deathstrike. Yes, we have Lady Deathstrike introduced. If I have one complaint about Lady Deathstrike is that we didn't really learn much about her in the movie, uh, other than she was another Weapon X type project. Basically, the female Wolverine also had the heightened healing power like Logan does and such and they have a terrific fight scene uh, very very exciting very very vicious they're just not holding back anything just stab it's a very stabby fight <laughs> uh, both of them just stabbing the heck out of each other yeah and that's and that's quite an exciting uh fight it's good to see good to see lady deathstrike in action at least in that form unfortunately she dies so i guess we'll never see her again <laughs> but it would have been nice to to get a little bit more backstory with that character especially since her character is essentially brainwashed through the entire movie and only very briefly regains her own mind uh just as she's dying so sorry 
You were cool while you lasted. And speaking of standout Wolverine moments, holy crap, that scene at the school where Stryker's men are uh, invading and, uh, you know, knocking out the kids and trying to kidnap everybody and trying to kill people. And it's just, it's just all hell's breaking loose. And we get to see Wolverine go into full-blown 100% berserker mode. Like, he is not taking this sitting down at all and shows them absolutely no mercy. In fact, they apparently had to trim that scene a little bit because it got a little bit too vicious. Uh, you can see some of the trims reinstated in the deleted scenes on the Blu-ray. Honestly, not very much. I mean, it, if it had been, say, an R-rated movie, that would have been a much bloodier scene because, I mean, there are many instances where Wolverine is basically just literally burying his claws in the chests of these guys. <laughs> and, <laughs> but that's okay. Whatever. It doesn't need to be all blood spray everywhere to... To know what's going on i mean those those guys are not getting up again after that but it was nice to be able to see because uh, that's i mean that's a side of wolverine that we do see uh at appropriate times in the comics so it was nice to uh to really see that in in the show in the show in the movie and the thing is um it wasn't just berserker rage for the sake of berserker rage it was with a purpose i mean he was cutting loose to protect the kids to protect the students. The thing is about Wolverine, he's, he's he, and I think the appeal of him is he's just such a fascinating multi-layered character. He has the animalistic, vicious side that, of course, everybody loves because it's the, the kick-ass Wolverine. But he's a good guy. Like, he's a good guy with a good heart, and he means well. He wants to do well by, you know, not just himself, but his his friends and family and, you know, people that he cares about. I don't want to say he's a big softy, but he does have a caring side. Like, he does care about people. And, I mean, we've seen that in the comics, and we see that most definitely in X2. We get to see a lot more of Mystique in action, using her stealthy capabilities in this one, uh, taking on a variety of different forms for a variety of different uh, sort of infiltration and spy missions. Uh, when she infiltrates uh, Stryker's base, she uses his face, she disguises herself as uh, Lady Deathstrike, and she disguises herself as the janitor to escape. Pretty interesting, actually, when she's hacking the computer system and looking at Stryker's files, because you, if, if you pause and check out the names, like the list of mutants and such, you'll see a lot of familiar names on there, one of which they kind of pause on briefly, uh, Remy LeBeau, who, of course, is Gambit, who has yet to really be represented properly in the movies, but we'll get to that when we talk about Wolverine Origins. And then even a lot of the file folders that she finds there, uh, you'll see reference to a lot of things from X-Men lore, such as uh, Muir Island and, of course, well, the other Cerebro, obviously. And uh, oh, I can't even remember now. There was a whole bunch. Anyway, if you just pause when, when it stops on the screens, uh, the computer screens, you'll see a whole bunch of cool little Easter eggs in there. The list of mutants is quite lengthy, and you'll recognize a lot of names on there if you're familiar with the comics. And then the file folders as well all reference other things. I should mention there's a reference to the Sentinels in there. Um, apparently the Sentinels and the Danger Room were originally going to appear in the movie in some capacity. There was going to be a danger room scene around the time, I think it was going to be around the time that Wolverine was left to look after the mansion. He'd be working out in the danger room just to work out and we get to see that in action using, you know, a, a typically dangerous scenario because it's Wolverine. He doesn't like it to be pulling punches on his behalf. He wants it to cut loose and have a proper workout. But for whatever reason, I think it was, I don't know, it was budgetary concerns or they just couldn't really work it in well. Uh, I mean, they even started building the set. Uh, I mean, if you look on the extras, they actually show the set for the Danger Room being built, but they just never got around to using it. So, for whatever reason, it's not in, in there. We did finally see the Danger Room in uh, the, the, I think it was one of the opening scenes of X-Men The Last Stand. I have not seen The Last Stand in about eight years, so tomorrow will be the first time I've seen it in eight years. It'll be interesting to see how much of my old opinions still hold. I don't know. We'll see. One of which I should mention, uh, Jean Grey. Jean Grey um, and her emerging powers over the course of X2. Now, one of my viewers commented, uh, was asking me uh, in my review for the first X-Men regarding the fight between Jean Grey and Toad. He said, uh, did you not feel that Jean Grey seemed a bit too weak in that scene? 
And yes, she did seem weak in that scene. I mean, Toad basically smoked her. She says it herself in one of the earlier scenes that her powers are still developing and they're nowhere near on the level of the professors yet, for example, when uh, Wolverine's asking her if she's ever tried Cerebro before. And I just kind of see it in that respect, is that we're seeing Jean as she's still developing her powers, so yes, she's weak. She hasn't really been in a lot of combat situations, per se, so she doesn't quite have those skills developed yet. So I, I don't have a problem with the fact that Toad defeated her so quickly in that scene, because I think it, it makes sense. Now we see her in the second one, seeing how it's developed, her powers are obviously a lot stronger, and we get hints of her emerging phoenix powers, which, of course, come to full fruition in the third one. Now, I have to say this about that. Back when I did my original rant for X3, one of the big complaints I had was how the phoenix story was dealt with. In particular, how uh, it was basically just Jean's powers increasing to the point where she lost control of them and they kind of took took over her and i was like what what the hell was that that that's not the phoenix story because i mean you have to understand i'm coming from the old school x-men so the phoenix story that i know is the original phoenix story my understanding now and this is thanks to a lot of viewers correcting me and and informing me about it later uh is that there was l a, a later revision of the Phoenix story. Maybe it was the X-Men Ultimates line. I, I don't know. I haven't read any of those, so I don't know what the differences are. Uh, but I know that a lot of aspects of the movies, the later ones in particular, took elements from the Ultimate X-Men rather than the classic X-Men. Well, I guess kind of a mishmash of the two. So my understanding is that this new version of the Phoenix story and how her powers emerged is more related to that version rather than the classic version, which was, you know the the alien power taking her over so that she could go and fight the space war <laughs> so i don't know we got that version in the in the animated series adapted pretty darn faithfully so i guess their take on it was well we'll do the other version then so in that respect uh i i can't hate that interpretation anymore because it actually is true to the particular comics that they were referring to so I got to backpedal a little bit on that one eight years later. And in particular, re-watching the movies so close together, I'm seeing a lot more connections between them that I may not have picked up on previously because it had been such a huge gap between uh, watching them. This is why it's good to re-watch the old ones before you go to see the new ones. And that said, throughout X2, there are hints repeatedly that that is the direction that Jean's character is going, that that is what is happening to her. Her powers are emerging when she gets particularly stressed or what have you. You see her eyes, like you see the flames coming up in her eyes, and you see like the almost rage that, that she gets with the phoenix power starting to manifest. Now, we just, we just get little hints of that, but it's clearly going in that direction. Then the final scene, where she's both piloting the Blackbird remotely and holding back the floodwaters, she's almost in full-blown Phoenix mode right there. I mean, she is, like, right on the cusp, and she knows that the next step will happen, whether she wants it to or not. And she's just basically accepted it and is going to ride it out. And, well, we have to tune in next time to find out what happens. So some other character stuff I enjoyed. Um, I like the budding romance between Bobby and Rogue. I think that's very sweet and, and cute. And, uh, and I like how they're trying to kind of work around the obvious problem <laughs> that such relationship would have. I also like the fact that the ice guy and the fire guy are hanging out. So you got Iceman and Pyro hanging out when they're at the, you know, the museum. They have that little tussle with the 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 local jerks, you know. And then we have that cool scene where Professor X just kind of freezes everybody and then they make a hasty retreat. Yeah, just just cool little stuff like that, uh, little character bits. You get to see them using their powers in different ways and um, I just enjoy that. And then there's that wonderful little scene where uh, where Pyro is talking to Magneto in the Blackbird, and uh, he says, you know, I can I can control the fire, but I can't create it. And Magneto just looks at him and says, you're a god among insects, and don't let anyone ever tell you different. 
wow. Because, <laughs> I mean, throughout the whole thing, Pyro's been kind of the, you know, the troublemaker, a little bit of little bit of an outcast amongst his peers because of that. Well, and then there's that scene where he's laying waste to the police cars and everything when they come to Bobby Drake's place, or they're hiding out. And... Wow, I mean, uh, but I mean, he's struggling for acceptance. He, he's, you know, a bit of a loose cannon, a bit of a hothead, dare I say it. Because, I mean, anyway, who reads the comics knows that Pyro is a bad guy, and he's always been a bad guy. So it was interesting for me to see how they uh, dealt with the origins of that character. I mean, we saw him in the briefly in the first one, a little bit of, you know, playing around, makes a fireball in class, and then Bobby freezes it, and... Yeah, I mean, that was a bit of fun. But in this one, I really like how they developed that more and how we got to see a lot more of his character. And, and I really like the actor who played him, actually. I think he did a terrific job. Speaking of the scene at Bobby's place, uh, the, the wonderfully awkward scene with his parents. Uh, <laughs> when she, she asks him, have you ever tried not being a mutant? <laughs> Obvious parallel there being, have you ever tried not being gay or not being transsexual or, or whatever the case may be? Yeah, apparently Ian McKellen gave them a bit of guidance on that and said, you know, the, w the way this scene is, I mean, I think it would be perfect if you played it out as a coming out scene, essentially. I mean, he's coming out to his parents as a mutant, so just treat it as if he's coming out like he's gay or something like that and i think it worked really well i mean it was very appropriately awkward and, and that's one of the things i've always loved about the x-men just generally is the fact that it, it shines a light on these various prejudices that exist in our world just puts them in a fantastical context so you have the superpowers i mentioned that previously how it's like you, you have the teen angst aspect of it uh, and the the trials and tribulations of puberty but with superpowers added on top of it and uh, same kind of thing. Uh, one of my viewers actually pointed out, uh, I, and I wanted to clarify a little bit. Uh, he said, I think he, he felt that I was kind of belittling the world of the X-Men by saying it's a teen angst uh, story. Uh, allow me to clarify. The way he put it was, uh, in particular when Chris Claremont was writing it, it was about people with superpowers, not just teenagers with superpowers. And that's very true. I mean, when it started, it was primarily about teenagers. That was kind of the uh, the, the core idea. But uh, did Chris Claremont take it in, in, in much, you know, higher and deeper directions? Absolutely he did. He is without question one of the all-time great writers of the X-Men. In fact, um, the extras on X2 have a pretty extensive interview with him about uh, his time as a writer. They interview him and Stan Lee, and they both sort of talk about their respective takes on the on the comics. And Chris Claremont himself talks about how faithful the movies are being to the comics and the spirit of the comics and su such. And he pretty much talks about what I've always said, is that you know people who complain about it not being a verbatim adaptation of the comics really misunderstand what an adaptation is. When you're taking 50 years worth of comics and distilling them down to a series of movies, you cannot be verbatim. You just can't. It's not possible. And you, you take it from one medium to the next, there's going to be changes, there's going to be allowances for, for the uh, medium. Uh, another viewer mentioned the fact that they don't, don't don't have their costumes from the comics. And it's like, well, of course they don't, because spandex looks great on the drawn page, but it looks ridiculous in live action. So no, they don't have the uh, the costumes. Now, could they have used a little bit more color rather than just going with black? Absolutely, of course. I mean, maybe have sort of a blue motif for uh, for Storm. Maybe some kind of a yellow motif or a brown motif, depending which year you want to go with. Uh, for Wolverine, I don't know stuff like. Did I say Storm? I meant Cyclops. A blue motif for Cyclops, a black motif for Storm. Maybe kind of a you know dark green. I mean, you still have dark colors, just a little bit more color there. Like I don't know, maybe maybe in the new ones. At least with Magneto, we had the you know the red. Like well, in this case, maroon, uh, which I think worked well. It's kind of a, a muted version of the Magneto colors that we've come to uh, recognize over the years. I don't know. I mean, that, that that's such a small issue to me, uh, what the costumes look like. I mean, for me, it's about the characters and the stories more than anything else, just like the comics have been. I don't, don't, don't think I'm writing it off as just a teen angst story because that's not what I meant by that at all. I just meant that that was sort of the basis for the core concept originally and one of the things that attracted me to it. 
Uh, I mean, the things that made me stay, obviously, was the quality of writing of Chris Claremont, period. I mean, just the depth of characterization and the, the real deep issues dealt with. I mean, th this one being a prime example of that right there. I mean, this is just a, an amazing story. And it does not surprise me that they chose that as uh, kind of the template for developing the story for X2. Uh, so overall, did I like X2? Well... Do you need to ask? Hell yeah, I liked X2. Uh, that is one that I will definitely revisit again and again. Like I said, I mean, I, I, I forgot how good it was. It's, it's been so long since I've watched it. Yeah, so it's I've, I'm having a blast revisiting these movies, I gotta say. Um, yeah, so I guess that pretty much wraps it up for X2, X-Men United. Big uh, big thumbs up there. Just, uh, just loved it. So we'll see you next time. So a quick thank you to my Patreon sponsors, especially Get Your Gorgeous On, uh, the wonderful EMEG uh, maintained by Michelle O'Toole and Simon Hedger, and of course Kyle Pellegree, my current highest level sponsors. So please do consider becoming a Patreon sponsor because it just means I can do this stuff more often for you. And that's not a bad thing. Alrighty, that is it for me to you for now. So until next time, thanks for watching, and sayonara.